thanks everyone for coming uh, to the event tonight. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at powells.com. One of the one of the many events that we're looking forward to is Daisy Hernandez in conversation with Amy Stewart about Hernandez's new book, The Kissing Bug, a true story of a family, an insect in a nation's neglect of a deadly disease. That's coming up next Tuesday, the 15th. And if you don't do so yet, please follow us on social media. You'll get the inside scoop on everything happening in our stores and online and, uh, and these events that happen pretty often. Tonight, we're excited to have Jonathan Evison and Thomas Constam. Jonathan Evison is the author of several novels, including West of Here, This Is Your Life, Harriet Chance, and most recently, his new book, The Legends of the North Cascades. Poignant and profound, Evison's new novel, Legends of the North Cascades, brings his trademark vibrant, honest voice to bear on an expansive story that is at once a meditation on the perils of isolation and an exploration of the ways that connection can save us. Dave Cartwright used to be good at a lot of things, good with his hands, good at solving problems, good at staying calm in a crisis, but on the heels of his third tour in Iraq, the fabric of Dave's life has begun to unravel. Gripped by PTSD, he finds himself losing his home, his wife, his direction. Most days, his love for his seven-year-old daughter, Bella, is the only thing keeping him going. When tragedy strikes, Dave makes a dramatic decision. The two of them will flee their damaged lives, heading off the grid to live in the wilderness of the Pacific Northwest. As they carve out a home in a cave in the harsh, breathtaking landscape, echoes of its past begin to reach them, and the novel turns into a timeless odyssey. Jonathan joins us from Squim, Washington tonight. Joining Evison is in conversation this evening is Thomas Constam. Thomas's novel, Lake City, was called, quote, a caustic satire on class privilege and deprivation by the Seattle Times. His earlier book, Do Travel Writers Go to Hell, is one of Outside Magazine's favorite road novels and is currently in development as a feature film. He's currently working hard on a novel, on a, com a comedic novel about a multi-generational Seattle family. And he joins us from Seattle. This evening's event includes an audience Q&A. If you have a question, please hit that Q&A button. You can ask your question in there. Uh, if someone has typed a question that you are interested in as well, go ahead and click the thumbs up on that question. And um, more importantly, uh, you can support Jonathan and Powell's by purchasing a copy of his new book from us. A link to buy Legends of the North Cascades will be uh, shared in the chat a couple of times this evening, as well as information on Thomas's books. Uh, Jonathan Thomas, it's great uh, to have you here. Um, we had you in the store before, and it's always great to see you, but this is, I guess, the next best thing. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, I wish we could be there in person. We'll get there. For now, yeah, we got each other right here. At least that, you know, we don't, you know, I put this up so you don't have to look at my dead house plants and you know my cats, stuff like that. So I know, yeah. So I know uh, Zoom isn't exactly ideal, but um, you know this is this is a, a great opportunity, um, and um, I'm just really excited to be here with one of my favorite writers, one of my favorite bookstores, and um, getting to drink a beer here in my basement. I see my friend Jay from Madison, Wisconsin, calling in. You can't, uh, you know, can't do that in person. So this is, uh, you know, there's there's some cool things to to this whole new Zoom world too. But um, I just wanted to start and say I I first uh, read Legends in the North Cascades. Um, uh, before, well, and it came out in an ARC in ARC. And um, I've read all of Johnny's books um, and I felt like he was onto something really different here. Had 
somebody sent it to me with a different name on the cover, um, I might have believed it was actually a different writer. Not that, not that I don't see, um, you know, many Evisonian traits in the book. It, you definitely have, you know, well-intentioned, large-hearted characters, um, that same sort of encouraging you to, I, I think one of the things about his books that that really um, shine through in all of them is really encourages you to just be empathetic and, and think about um, uh, other people's lives and experiences and, 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 and transport yourself. But um, this was dramatic and weighted in a, in a um, different way that I haven't really seen you sustain end to end, you know, end to end. And uh, you hit some really uh, heavy emotional notes in this one. And, um, you know, for all you, I'm not going to give anything away, but uh, for all you who haven't read the book yet, this is, I would argue, one of your better conclusions, uh, Johnny. I think you you really, uh, really hit that one um, hard and, and really pushed some boundaries. I um, Before we get into questions and stuff, I, can we skip doing a premise here? I know you don't want to do a premise and we got a pretty good premise up front. I'll, I'll, I'll give a, I'll give a little, you want, how about I'll, I'll give a little overview here, and you would tell me. Uh, sure, man. Tell me yeah, what you please. what you think of my spare, take on stuff. If you can spare me that, it's my nightmare yeah. trying to. Yeah. God, it's I'll, 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 I'll try to spare it. you the promise here. Uh, invite me back for another reading in the future, maybe. Um, but it's two interwoven stories of a single parent and a child, and it takes place in the in the same cave in the North Cascades, one present day and one thousands of years ago. So, um, you know, both of these, um, the, both of these parent and child and children are outside of their communities trying to find life and family on their own and dealing with universal challenges of trauma, relationships between parents and children, between men and women, between people and the environment, between individuals and the society, between parenthood and society. Um, and this one starts, it starts with you know, a veteran taking his, you know, traumatized person taking their daughter off into the Cascades. I was thinking like, this is like dad version of first blood, basically. I don't know if you're, you know, up in, up in, which took place in, in essentially same, same part of the country. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a former high school football star. This is Dave um, and he's got PTSD and he's a widower. And he rejects society and takes his daughter off to live in this cave. And okay, so you get a sense of where that story is going. And then that's when like the acid kicks in and it's just like, boom, you know, ice age, mother, you know, and you just took a massive swing there. Um, and the, the story goes in a completely... I'm not going to say different direction than you think, um, but it's, it goes in a much more expansive direction than um, you're imagining as as the reader. Um, so before I, I have kind of a question that comes off of that, but um, did uh, well, and, and then also the the daughter Bella, she starts to either a channel or it, it's a little bit unclear whether this this whole other story is happening simultaneously is she, is she channeling it or not how is uh you know them being in the same cave is she is she experiencing um some some messages from the past if you will um and i'll you know i I wanted to just start off like one thing. So, so Johnny and I, we talk a lot about writing and he's uh, helped me with a lot of stuff. And one of the things we've been talking about lately is in the beginning of a book, making promises to your, to your readers and, and establishing up front an, uh, some, some sense of this is what you're going to get if you embark on this journey. I, um, a lot happens in the beginning of the book. There's a, you know, without giving away too much, there's a death, whatever. Um, I, I was wondering what, you know, what you saw as the promises that you you set you set out to make to the to the reader in the early parts of the story. Um, I actually, once I figured out the whole narrative, I really kind of, I really started using misdirect really early, actually, on this one because. Uh, you know, I mean, it promises to be this outdoor adventure, I guess, but uh, I think 
I think the reason I had to design the narrative structure that way, I'm sorry, I'm a little all over the place about it. I'm just still learning, uh, you know, developing some kind of facility to talk about this book because I haven't talked about it very much, but- uh, Let's work, we'll work through it together. This is a- What you described as the big leap didn't feel like a big leap to me because it, you know, if you're setting out to write a book about two people in the cave, it's gonna be, you know what I mean? You're risking getting, it could be a pretty insular sort of uh, suffocating experience as a reader. And, and I knew I needed it to, to open up. And, uh, and that's why I, 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 I use that sort of Greek chorus of the town too, of all these voices from Dave's life trying to pull him back. And I look at the other, that, that the, the Cordillera ice sheet, it's uh, so that second narrative Thomas mentioned happens in the, at the, the end of the late Pleistocene. So like 15,000 years ago. Uh, and to me, that's kind of, that's kind of, that's Bella's connection to some outside world. I couldn't just have two people in a cave all the time. I'd kind of like to write that novel. I just don't know that anybody would like to read it, but, uh, so, I, I mean, mean you, uh, to be fair, you could have, it could have been the drama back and forth between the town and the, you know, gone more of the, the first blood direction where you have like, you know, Brian Dennehy sheriff coming out trying to get Rambo out of the woods. And I mean, and, and there's some elements I honestly of that. Honestly, confess, I've never seen the movie, but oh, you, you had yeah, me in a, Brian Dennehy. I love Brian Dennehy. He was, he was quite a thespian. Um, Richard Crenna, yeah, there's some, I mean, the, the screenplay was co-written by Stallone, but there was, it was based on a 1972 novel, actually. Hope Washington, so it takes place. Anyways, I'll stop talking about it. Yeah, but you know, I don't like the linear timeline, so I wanted to, I mean, I, I, I like bifurcated timelines. I did it before with West of Here, but it was like 115 years. This time I wanted to really, I'd like, you know, I always want to challenge myself. So I thought, well, well shit, why not 15,000 years? You know, I always I mean, thought when I was a kid when Carl Sagan, I remember Carl Sagan on Cosmo saying that thing about how the human brain, the human mind hasn't changed in like 120,000 years or something. And we have the, you know, we have the same faculties and capabilities. And um, so I thought it would be fun. Like there's not a lot of humor in this book compared to usual. I, I lean on humor a little bit more. Uh, for me, the playfulness sort of comes in the narrative and how I deal with the narrative and the playfulness sort of takes the place of the humor for me in order to just kind of deal with the material. Um, where was I going with that? I don't even remember. Well, what I was uh, well one, other, one other thing I was gonna say that we forgot to say at the top was that um, with, with, please feel free to jump in the Q and A at any point. And we're not gonna do this like a, a traditional reading where we um, stack those toward the end. So uh, we'll try to uh, just mix those in as people ask them. But I, I mean, I think that it, it takes real cojones as a writer to take that swing. Um, I'm sorry about the dog in the background here. This is Zoom life. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm currently struggling with writing a scene about a, a elementary school auction in 2014. And like, you know, to, to decide, just to decide that you're gonna, right. And especially, especially in a, in a time, um, you know, where people are getting pushed back for writing beyond their gender or sexual orientation, um, ethnicity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, making that big bet, uh, I, I, I just, um, yeah, I, 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 I think that, I don't know that I could have, I, I don't know that I could have done it. And I, I think it's, it's pretty fun. Impressive, so. I mean, I'll be honest, it's just yeah. fun. I mean, I, why not? I mean, if it, 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 the worst that happens is I fall flat on my face. I mean, I want to, I want to play you, in a high stakes and game. Yeah, and it didn't. Um, did you, did you, when you were writing, did you write, uh, did you jump back and forth between the two timelines or did you, in, in your first draft in particular, did you, did you tend to keep them separated in like today is a today is a present day day or no nah, no nah, I wrote it totally linearly uh I, I just so I just let it unfold organically it became pretty easy the two worlds became one world for me and just in my conception of the thing so it really became a matter of uh I I always knew where I left the last character off you know it, it was pretty easy to go through that. And I, and I wanted to create a texture, you know, between the two. I'm afraid of writing stuff like that, where it's like, if the two things are going to be in conversation, I want to write them in conversation. You know what I mean? I don't want to write one side of the conversation and then write 
the other side because I'll be missing opportunities, basically. You know what I mean? Uh, you know how it is when you're on the page and you're inside the story and you get out of your own way. It's like uh, doing them one after the other and just letting it unfold organically like that. Just it allowed me to really just connect the two worlds in certain ways and made it easier to um because you know when you have this when you're worried about a narrative arc and narrative momentum and stuff like that but then you're splitting it up between two timelines um you, you have to be aware of the overall sort of orchestral swelling of the thing and when i write them back to back and together i can kind of feel them working together to build you know what i mean because the two stories start to run parallel and then it becomes more of like a call and response and so if I'm writing a call and response, I want to write the call and then I want to write the response right after. I mean, you could logically, I could see why somebody might attack it that way. Like, let's do all the modern parts because that's where my head is. And then, but I don't, I don't think it, in fact, that was one of the things that I thought about Cloud Atlas when I read it, because it's one of my favorite books, even though like, like every book, it, it fails on some level, but it's like one of my favorite books. But like, when I read it, I was like, it's interesting because like, you just felt that he wrote them separately. Mm -hmm. And that really inspired me because that made me, that's why when I, that book kind of inspired me to write West of Gear, like really just swing for the fences and mm -hmm. write 48 points of view. But because of the fact that I, the one thing I lacked in that book was that connectivity. He's just such a narrative master, but I just lacked a little narrative uh, connectivity besides like the birthmark. I wanted the book to be all about that connectivity. You know what I mean? So I really want it weave them both together as much as possible so that they don't read like two novels and it, and it, and it works and i could see i could see how if that gap existed too much i could really harm the overall uh they could seem seem bolted together if they didn't work yeah uh you know didn't have that uh, synchrony um but um so so Johnny, tell me, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but you usually write like two and a half, three days a week, like 12, 16 hour days, sort of you kind of go all in um, for a shorter, shorter period over the week. Is that pretty accurate? No, it's interesting because with this particular yeah. book, this really hurt me kind of because, uh, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing like Wednesdays, Thursdays and half a Friday. And so I do like 12 hours, 12 hours six hours or sometimes 16 hours, 16 hours, eight hours or something like that, which is a great way to write, except it was really hard with this book because it's so painful. Like Dave is just being inside of Dave. Like, you know, if I was writing five days a week, I could write for three hours and then get outside of him because it's kind of not a nice place to be. I mean, the guy's yeah. got a lot of baggage so and suffering and, and to, you know how hard it is when you have kids to write sometimes just because you, you get so little time to yourself like just to sit and be yourself that like sometimes it's hard to give yourself up and get into the work and it was especially hard some days with Dave because I just knew it was going to be emotionally draining and also because I dared to do it without the humor which usually keeps my spirits buoyed or what you know what I mean that allows me to to not go full dark and this book also, kind of it's goes, almost like character actor work you have to get in that you know in that mindset and then you're maintaining it um uh yeah, yeah method the, acting for sure i think the process is a lot like method right, acting. yeah that's a method no, i'm sorry i said you, character you, that's you, what i meant uh, you got to get out of your own way and you give yourself up to the thing but man it can be suffocating and do you do you have a process for getting i mean i i know that you you spent a lot of time thinking uh you know daydreaming you know, ahead of time and then and then try to hit it hard when you get in but do you have a process for sort of getting in the in the mindset of a specific character like Dave, or is it is it a different process for different characters? Or you just at this yeah, point? it's not a different process for different characters. It's just getting out of your own way. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like I just like for the other four days, and I'm not writing. I'm constantly sending myself notes and stuff and text, but like I don't. Uh, I uh, I just tell myself I'm going to hit the ground running on Tuesday. It's just it's almost like an athlete psyching themselves up when the whistle blows on Sunday. I'm going to be game ready. I'm going to be ready to play just psyching yourself up to be productive, just about your workflow. It's just like a trusting the process. And then, then I get there early and I just, I dive right into it. How do you get game, do you, how do you get game ready to like write a caveman sex scene? Is that? It's easier than you think. <laughs> All right. Um, right on. Um, so one of the things that's in the, um, you know, in the title of the book, it's Legends of North Cas Cascades. And, it was only after the book that I started to think a little bit more about the role of legends in it. Um, 
And um, I, I thought maybe you could elaborate just on that element in the book, just the layers to being a legend. What it, it started coming together for me that that um, you know Dave's former football football hero and or you know top football player in the school. Um, a veteran and the role that veterans hold in, in society now you see kind of like in you know a Billy Lynn um, you know um, type type story and um, and uh, you know just like what it what a legend does for a community and you know that gap between how a legend or you know is is understood and um, and who they really are as people or the pain that they're actually going through. Uh, to, can you can you elaborate a little bit just on the role of like uh, you know what I mean, you're trying to accomplish? Thanks. Perfect. Yeah. Well, that's 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 <laughs> um, we're good. Yeah. No. I mean, there's a yeah. There's different l levels of it. I mean, like Dave's kind of a legend in the town, and that and the voices sort of make you feel. That. I mean, first he's a legend for what he does on the gridiron, but eventually he's a legend because he's a damaged dude that moves out into a cave, and that's when he becomes Cave Dave, and like. You know the second graders at his old Which elementary. Which is the origi yeah. original name of the book, right? Is that Cave yeah, Dave? Yeah, originally I wanted to name the book Cave Dave, but uh, then I settled on Legends of the North Cascade because it fits it better. But uh, yeah, so I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. Um, yeah, no, we're just talking about how about a little bit about just the gap between how he's he's held up as a you know, as a, as a hero or a legend. And, and I, I, I don't know, I, th I thought you, I thought you explored that well in the book and, and just, you know, kind of the myth around a person versus the reality of, of people, people suffering and what they're actually going through. Um, uh, I don't know. Maybe legend think plays into the whole ice age thing too, because you, it's very ambiguous. You don't know if, if these are visions that are, uh, you know, I know, but I'm not going to share that information because it's totally up for interpretation. But like, it's it's ambiguous in the book. Like, it, it you know, where does this is this you know, where are these stories well, coming from? Is it from her trauma? Are these is it a real connection or is this just tied to the legend she was told as a kid? And right on. Um, so that kind of ties into. Uh, you know, another big question that I think is is asked in in the book, and um, something that that we continue to to think about afterwards, is is you know our society and improved security and technology and parenting as a verb and all this sort of stuff. Is this actually improving children's lives and making them happier, um, or you know, it, is our existential dread and anxiety and a lot of general unhappiness in society nowadays is that is it because we're moving further and further away from our from our natural state um i you know is 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 that something that you have any sort of uh stronger stronger thoughts on and like uh, you know especially coming out the other side of of covid here and how um yeah, I didn't mean to, I didn't, obviously, I didn't see what was coming. I wrote this book in like yeah. 2018. And Which, yeah, self-isolation yeah. is self a Self-isolation isolation is a big theme in the book. Yeah, it's basically the theme. But then when I think about it in some form, it's a, it's just self-isolation is a, is a theme I'm kind of preoccupied with in a lot of my work, you know, because it, there's so much inherent drama in it, you know, the, 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 the dictates between, you know, uh, aloneness and community you know uh the, the, you know together or by ourselves uh, th th there's just so much drama you know you know how they say every book ends like either with the well never mind yeah so i'm not my uh, i don't know man i these critical questions are hard for me i feel like i got bob costas questioning me right now i haven't even really thought you I've want, you want to talk you want to talk about process because, well i do uh, i i just yeah. i'll be honest i can't even hardly remember because i've written three books since then i'm i that i i went ape shit during the uh pandemic man i just were i just put my head down at work i didn't know I mean, yeah no you uh you have an impressive output to say the least um but um, it's the only place I like myself is on the page, man. 
So I just try to write as much as possible that every every time is that a soul, every is that time a I do one of these shoes, something in is me it? dies because I have to look at my big fat face up there and I just hate myself. I'm like, ah, oh, just read the stop. book. God, I just stop. want to hold the book. Just read the book. Well, you talk about redemption in there a lot. You want to talk more themes? Wait, I got I got I got more themes to come. Um, uh, I like that my best friend's wising off in the chat now. Thanks, Top. I didn't even hear one of your questions because I'm looking at him wising off there. Um, well, so so we can talk a little bit about about process stuff. Um, how about like the conclusion? So again, I mentioned you have a really strong conclusion in this book. In your process of writing this conclusion, was this the was it the conclusion? You're like, I got this book dialed. I have this great conclusion and I'm aiming towards that or were you just aiming towards something else and you hit this point and you're like that's it I'm good did it did you did you happen upon it or was this you know pre pre-organized it's interesting you ask that because actually one of the reasons I'm able to undermine reader expectation I think really well in this book is because I was actually building towards this different conclusion at first that and question, yeah. you know what I mean? And I'm like, then I, then I saw the opportunity. Then I, then I realized I got that far in the book and I realized that that isn't the conclusion I wanted. I, I love the characters too much and that's not what I wanted. And, 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 and a whole new, uh, I started to look at the, the, the novel in a whole different context. And, but it allowed me to play with reader expectation in that way. Cause I was built, I don't want to give up too much even on this because no, I, yeah, no. well, you can, you can speak, because one of the things about this about book, it. I know is that you have no idea where it's going. You may think you do, but I don't think you really know where it's going. I mean, uh, you know, my, the, my readers have all said that, that I've talked to it just like it, I thought it was going to end way differently. You know, I yeah. didn't think it was going there or something. Well, that's what, that's what makes it a, a good conclusion is like upending expectations, getting, you know, people maybe not getting what they want but what they need what they deserve something like that i'm not sure um so just about here's a question about themes from more of a process standpoint though in in a book like this so i, I would say like you you have i see kind of two two camps in your books in general you have the um the uh like lulu Lawn boy, uh, more personal, um, you know, per personal books. Maybe a little more on the on the comedic spec end of the spectrum. And then you have your more your more epic books. Uh, you know, West of Here and upcoming Small World. This is kind of right in the middle, I would say. Um, and uh, it's so so you definitely took a a bigger swing in certain aspects. I'm I'm wondering like thematically and some of these things that I was asking you about before were those things that did did the book did this book really reveal itself to you as you were writing it or was it something you know was it that you had a, a pretty yeah, fixed idea totally it, yeah. yeah I mean and and then I, I'd say like this is your life Harriet Chance is also one of those in the middle you're right I mean at, at first I was actually That's switching true. I was consciously That's going back and forth from like first person narratives to third person narratives. Like, you know, Lulu is a first person. Then I went to third person with uh, West of here. Then when I went back to a first person, then I went third person and for, I had for about four or five books there, I had a, a rhythm. And then I think with Harriet, I kind of, I, I went second person part of the time. And then I, I actually added sort of a structure to it that was yeah. bigger than more of a picaresque or a, or a coming of age, and then I did the same thing here, kind of. But that's it's interesting that you say that because I would I would have grouped Harriet originally with the other ones. Maybe I'm just thinking more from length. But one thing about both of these books is that both both Harriet and, and I don't want to say like you know these are these are my favorite of your books because it's you know uh, there are different things that I like for different reasons, but. But both Harriet Chance and and uh, Legends um, just really upended my expectations, and I came away from them. I, I, I entered both books thinking that I had a grip on, you know, coming all the way back to my first question about like I thought thought I had a grip promises, on what yeah. I on make what promises and I lie. Yeah, <laughs> good. I like it that way. So I, mean, I, I guess I like being lied to and uh, and fooled. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I appreciated uh, being knocked a little off kilter with both. And, and both are 
both are more, I, I guess, also more ambitious than they may, be, may seem at first. Uh, Harriet Chance, for those of you that don't know, it's about a, a, a senior citizen who's, you know, going on a, on a cruise trip up, up to Alaska and her husband's passed away. And uh, then it just shuffles the deck and starts flipping through her entire existence. And um, yeah, I hadn't really seen that connection so much till now. Um, there we go. Do you have a background in geologic studies? Your books have a spectacular sense of place and natural world descriptions. I presume this book will have similarities. Wow. Well, thank you. First of all, that's nice. I work really hard at that. That's the one time, you know, I'm not, I'm not somebody who works my prose a lot. You know what I mean? In general, I just want it to swing. But when I do write about the natural world, that's the time I'm the most, I just feel like the onus is on me to get it so right. You know what I mean? Because I'm usually, when I'm reading, I, I don't casually write about environments like the Olympics or the North Cascades. I mean, I want to capture the grandeur. And I did a bunch of study. I don't have a particular background in it, but like, uh, so like the beginning of Legends, Melissa, I don't think you've read that judging from the question. It's interesting because what you say, you're going to really ask that question after the first, like the, 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 the first two pages of the novel, because it's sort of an overview of the entire geologic history of the North Cascades, you know, uh, like 20 million years on, on the two pages. And that was condensed from, you know, two notebooks worth of research. You know what I mean? Like two, two you know, I mean, probably like 20 pages of notes or something, you know what I mean? Just to get, just to, just to get that information down to that and do it justice. Um, I just have so much awe and respect for the natural world that I, I, I just, I got to get it right, man. I, I want to get it right. And I don't want to, I never want to, I never want to do that thing. Sometimes when I'm reading what is considered great nature writing, I mean, the writing is good, but like what, what, what sometimes it does for me is it just kind of stops the narrative. And then here we are talking about nature. I try to, I'm always trying to present in nature and I think that's why it comes to life a little bit more is I'm always just trying to walk my characters through it more than just describing it like a you know like a big establishing shot you know what I mean and talk I like to have my characters moving through it as they describe it I like to keep some sort of momentum because I do really want to wax about it you know what I mean that's one of the it's one of the few times I really wax in my book books are, are either like emotional beats or talking about nature and but I want to do that in a way that uh it's just seamless with the story just like when you're walking around and taking it all in you know I don't want the reader to just stop and just like you know it's real important to not have any false notes too right I mean that can just some, one one false note in the book and you could be done you could lose the reader yeah. And that's why that brings up like with Dave, for instance, you know, I write outside of my purview all the time and I, I don't, I'm not a three time. I mean, I'm not an 80 year old woman like Harriet, obviously. And I'm not a, I'm not a three time uh, combat veteran in Iraq. And, and, and when I decide to take the risk to write outside of my purview like that, and sometimes it's race, sometimes it's class. Sometimes it's, when I do that, I always lean heavily on P, you know what I mean? I, I, I lean heavily on like, you know, my first drafts, I try to feel my way through it from what I've read and what experience I, I know about veterans, you know, maybe in an early draft, but not soon after I get into it, like I started interviewing combat vet veterans and stuff like that and started having them, you know, vet things completely. Like, I, I mean, I had to get by them to know that I didn't have a false note. So they read everything. I would send them all, every combat chapter, everything. And, you know, when I first started, I didn't have access to these people yet. And so I read this like big New York Times expose on like, you know, the war jargon of Iraq or something. So I thought, you know, I'd drop in some of these little terms. I wish I could remember some of them. Uh, I'd drop in some of these terms to sound like an insider. And then when I gave it to my friend, Paul, uh, who is, uh, did three tours, he, uh, his notes were hilarious, man. Like he's just, he was, he's really funny. He's like, this sounds like a fucking Navy federal commercial. What the fuck's a, we don't call it that. We call it a, you know what I mean? So I had, I, I went through layers of this, you know, and I'm like, you got, I let him beat me up about it. I mean, I just wanted to make sure I didn't hit a single false note because that's the risk you take. I don't want anybody to say that I can't write outside of my own experience, whatever that means. I want to be able to write a black woman if I want to write one. And I, I know, I, I, and it's not that I'm trying to appropriate that experience. It's that I'm trying to, to understand that experience. I'm trying to 
to, to jump through that empathic window and walk a mile in, in somebody else's shoes. And, and well, the owner is not to get it right, though, you know? And I say, if I get it wrong, well, then, you know, drag me over the coals of public opinion or whatever. But like, I want, that's why I write, is to try to occupy this otherness, to, to get inside of characters that are beyond my life experience. That brings me back to the earlier question about, um, or our earlier conversation about writing about the the ice age and that that why why that's such a big swing. On on one level, there's nobody to say, um, you know, oh, this was my experience. It's actually different. But but you really humanize, you um, know, in, in a way that I yeah, this is clan of the cave bear, and maybe I just haven't seen enough other books on this. But for me. Um, you really, this wasn't like, you know, Geico caveman or something like that is like, you really, really humanize these characters. And, um, and, you know, it, it, at least for me, I, I think I, I probably in the back of my mind was looking for some sort of a false note and, and the, the um, how real those characters seemed and how the similarity is between some of their trials and tribulations as humans and the current day ones is that 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 uh exchange between the two is is really kind of the the energy of the book in many ways yeah it goes it back to that thing kicks that your carl head off about, yeah goes back yeah, to that exactly. carl sagan thing about like yeah. the brain not changing over the hundred thousand years or whatever and it was like man i want to write i was raised by a single mom i know what that relationship like between a boy from childhood to adolescence with a single growing up with a single mom is like and i'm like i'm gonna just treat this like a pretty much a modern relationship you know what i mean the window dressing is different uh they're living under uh, a lot more stressful conditions and things like this but their general rapport you know i mean um yeah, they, they had less security but there were other you know other aspects of you know coming back to to uh what i was saying about like technology and society taking away from our, our natural state. Other things about their lives seem slightly more, maybe more positive than, um, I don't know, I, than, than present times too. So. so one thing I noticed about people that don't get this book is, and it's an interesting thing to me, uh, is that they can't forgive Dave for putting Bella in peril they can't admit that Dave's actually a good father, even though he makes bad he choices. Doesn't, he doesn't see it as that. Yeah, I know. I mean, some, I think some, yeah. readers, some, I mean, it's hard for us to put aside ourselves. And that's why I write again. I want to get, I want to get beyond, I want to get out of my own way and get beyond and, and see the world through a lens where that looks like a good decision. And I can imagine a world where that looks like the best decision, like where that looks like, and, and, and I, I got a, an email from the wife of a veteran uh, two days ago it was in saying, thank you, you got it so right. I'm married to a, a PTSD uh, Iraq uh, combat veteran and you just totally captured it. And like, that's the greatest thing I could ever hear. I mean, that's what I'm hoping for, you know, because I mean, it's just the experience of like getting out outside of myself. I mean, it sounds kind of schizophrenic or whatever, but I, that's why I write. I really want to get outside of myself. I just, I don't know why I don't like myself. I just don't. I, I'm willing to inhabit anybody else. And the more, the merrier. So like but, but, the world got 50 I mean, characters. Don't you think we though, we do have so many personalities and, and characters within with, you know, and people who don't don't write fiction don't necessarily, I mean, you can experience in other ways in, in acting or, or I don't know what, um, but it is a very meditative and cathartic process to explore. We have our, our version of ourselves that, you know, that we're most accustomed to and that we present to the world, but there, all these other, all these other voices and are, are possible within us. So you just have to like, basically either practice or lean into to channeling them. And I, I think that's one of the things that's so addictive about writing is, is it's that, it's that sort of, for lack of a better way, sort of meditative flow. Say when you're there and things are things are going well, and all of that energy is coming out through your eyes and fingers onto the page. It's it's very therapeutic. Um, I don't know. But, I, mean, I think so I love I love every one of my characters more than I love myself. 
I mean, it's like with my kids. I'm not. I'm not saying that yeah. to this. No, it's this. It's not a self-deprecating shtick. I, I just. I no, mean I it. know. I, just, I know. I'm it's able not. to. I'm able to to empathize with them in a way that. Uh, you know, most of the time I just walk around feeling like, what did you do to get so fucking lucky? You know what I mean? It's like you, you married the woman you love. You got three healthy kids. You live in the house you always wanted. You get to write books for a living. And I'm just kind of like, who the fuck are you? You know, I mean, I'm constantly like, that's what my inner voice is saying. And so when I'm dealing with people that are, have got bigger problems than mine right now, it gets me back into touch. I mean, it's not that I haven't had big problems in my life. It's just been pretty smooth sailing the last 10 or 15 years. And, and, I, I and, and you know also when you have kids you slow down you're not I'm not traveling around the world as much as I do and when I am mm -hmm. I'm going to Legoland you know what I mean mm -hmm. so like just it offers me a chance to to be my experience to be more expansive without having to get out of my pajamas or whatever. I did see a lot of you as a father in this book and and I mean for anybody who doesn't know Johnny he's a very he's a very doting uh you know energetic connected father um but i saw i saw a lot of and, and i mean I, I think about this stuff too in my writing right now because it's like when you're in the in the parent of a young kid zone it's it's all it's all consuming in certain ways but it, but i see a lot of the emotion there and i couldn't help but um, i know that bella isn't your 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 daughter daughter emma but i had trouble not imagining her as you know and just even the similarity in the name um uh but um, yeah, my mom said the same thing she saw emma there's a bit of emma there's a bit of owen she she's had a much tougher time than my kids my kids have had it pretty easy but it was so hard to write no sure about, i'm not yeah. I mean, but, but, the, but, the, but the emotional can no i understand and i mean this whole book is about people in deeply traumatic situations i it, it's heavy hitter but the 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 emotional connection there's there's still I don't want to say that it's lighter, but it's just the the description of the feeling between the parent and the child, the, the child and the adult, um, that that you you achieve some good. Um, I think that's the book. Universal. I mean, yeah. I think that relationship's really the book. I think to me, that's what drives the whole book. Is this I, 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 you, you may have just answered the question that just came up here, which is of all your books are one all your books are wonderful in their own ways. But what's what's your favorite thing about this book? If I can, if I can step on your toes here, I'd say that that's that's you know the the universality of the uh, or or the, the the common humanity in the in the parent child relationship, how that how that jumps back and forth between the two, and how that makes you just think about humanity in general. That's that's what uh, was most impressive for me. But I'll let you answer about your own book because I don't want my. I think that I my. Make... I really like the ending too. I just it felt good when I read wrote the ending I, I don't know I, I just I don't know I, I I just love them all and I feel grateful to to do it because I feel like I lived them you know and Hold on. I can't say what my favorite thing about it is I don't it's not, it wasn't the ambition or the conceit of making that jump I guess it's really just the relationship between uh I'm, I gotta get us uh, between um, Got a warm Dave and Bella and, and Sitka and Naka, those two relationships um, just gave me so much hope, you know, they just really buoyed me because it's a, it's a really, it's a dark book in many ways. I mean, I don't think the walk away is dark and I think, I don't think it's dark, like not Cormac McCarthy, creepy dark, but I mean, it's, it's, it, it's not, you know, nature is one of the things that saves it. The beauty and the grandeur around them is necessary. I mean, that book would have been just unreadable if they were living, you know, in an alleyway and eating out of dumpsters. Do you know what I mean? If I didn't have the natural beauty and grandeur to, to balance I, against them. I don't really have a formulated question out of this, but I'm just, just kind of a comment uh, that the, the way that you describe the space and a few books have done this for me over time, going all the way back to like the secret garden as a little kid, but where you describe this little space that's these people's little part of the world, it, it starts to feel, as a reader, it starts to feel, you feel some like sense of ownership, like you're building out this, so the, the cave and where they have the garden and where they, you know, where they go to the bathroom and where they store this and what they have in the cave, you, you start to color in this, this picture in your mind and feel a certain sort of connection with the plate, this, this little place that you can feel like you can actually contain in your in your imagination and um 
and I, I felt the connection with that in the in in the book too. I I enjoyed that. So um, I don't know if that was a byproduct or intentional. But um, if a reader has never read you, what book would you tell them to start with beyond this one? Uh, well, geez, I, I would want to know what they like to read. You know what I mean? If they like funny books, I'd probably. Uh, you know, I mean, like you said, I, every book's kind of different. I just don't know. I mean, there's some people, I've always kind of looked at it like there's, like when people read all my books, they either like West of Here the best or they like it the least. So I wouldn't start with that one. You know what I mean? Because there's a 50% chance they're going to absolutely love it. And then 50% chance they're going to just like not finish it. And then uh, a lot of readers don't like jumping around like Harriet does. I mean, if the, the question to me says like, what's the safest bet? Like I'm trying to hook this person to read the rest of my books. Maybe yeah. it'll be Lawn Boy. Maybe that is the most sort of universal yeah. appeal. Maybe that's the one that, that uh, I, fun, uh, uh, fundamentals is, is probably, yeah. Somebody said revised fundamentals of caregiving. I, I, I think revised fundamentals of caregiving is like, you could have gone Mitch Albom on that one and just written 10 more versions of that book and just cruise, you know, cruise. It, 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 it has probably like the, the most down the middle commercial appeal. And I don't mean that in a negative way at all. It has a lot of emotion in that book. Um, and um, I, I really love that book and it's really funny too. Um, movie but I people think that's like that one. Because now yeah. they want to make an Egyptian movie, but I don't think Netflix is going to let them. <laughs> an Egyptian uh, uh, Egyptian film company yeah. uh, contacted me last week, and they're like, "We want to have an Egyptian film." I really hope. I have no happens. idea what that would look like, but that's cool. That that would uh, that would be fantastic. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, uh, it's hard to say what's it, you know, what's a good starting point. Yeah, maybe um, I think this would be a good starting point, um, and. Uh, yeah, lots of good, lots of good John Everson books. After, if you ask me this question in eight months, I'd probably say Small World, my book that comes out next, because I think it has a, I think it has a broad appeal. I think it has the ambition of a West of Here, but I think um, it has a different sort of narrative engine that's a little more of a page turner, not on purpose, but just because of the nature of the story and just uh, so like in eight months, West, I'm probably, uh, pretty confidently, I feel like that's going to be. I think that that's a book that's going to appeal to a, a, a pretty broad audience. Yeah, this guy, after this book, he just has, oh, you know, just another 600 page book coming out later this year and another one that's done and another one or pretty much done and then another one in process. So I'm taking notes on my boxing novel right now. Too. Gonna, dude, you got to come help me with my book. I don't, just give me some. Gladly, because I'm jealous. I want to write the book you're writing. I'm jealous. Mm -hmm. I love it. Thomas is writing this uh I, Kevin touched on it briefly in the intro, but it's called uh, Supersonic, and it's just, it's a, like the quintessential sort of Seattle novel covering a, a lot of eras, of, a lot of Seattle history, a lot of eras of Seattle, uh, with it's not as big of a lens as that sounds like, but like, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm like, hurry up, get me some pages, I want to read it, I want to, I mean, I, you know. You um, die or something, I'll finish it for you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And if you die, if you die, I will. Uh, I will help with the Everson Museum out in Squim. I will be the uh, curator and make sure to uh, just help uh, help negotiate that Egyptian film deal. <laughs> My wife has a little money. That should get you at least twenty nine ninety five. Yeah. <laughs> um, Right on. Does anybody, uh, I have a couple more uh, questions here for Johnny, but does anybody, we're kind of in our last 10 minutes. So if anybody has from the audience wants to get them in now is the time. Anybody but Tup. Yeah, any, but Tup's not allowed. Tup almost came and showed up in my house and was just gonna, Tup's, uh, Tup's my friend and Johnny's friend, Johnny's best friend. I'm just gonna sit, sit here over my shoulder and just kind of, Heckle me. Un Unnerve Johnny, Johnny throughout. He's going <laughs> to ring go. Sorry. Um, I don't know if that's funny or a bad joke, but somewhere in between. Um, any other questions? Um, all right. Is there anything else that you want to say, John? No, I want you to ask me another question. I'll all right. Um, so let's talk about, um, you know, when in your writing, 
you spend because you have this this split between being in Bainbridge, being with your family, and being in Swim, and focusing on um, what's a topic you need to write on before you croak from Justin. Thanks, Justin. Um, but but with the split, I know that you do a lot of daydreaming, and um, tell me about and and then and then focus writing in the other part. Tell me about where the story is where are you really making leaps in terms of creating and building out the story? Is it more on the page or is it more in your, in your open time creative thinking where, where you're coming up with, with your sort of big moments and whatnot? Is it, is there an answer to that? Is it, is it, um, is, is it, you know, yeah, it's two different mental processes. I mean, like when yeah. I'm on the page, yeah, is, I'm like yeah. in the story. And then when I do, you know, I do my war room stuff where I, Put out this all my big, the this big butcher paper. What? Well, that's not butcher paper. Yeah, I put the butcher paper out on the ping pong table, and then I just walk around the garage with my beer and make notes on these things. And and then as it, that as the weeks go on, I synthesize it into smaller and smaller chunks. And then, but I never have like I don't write scenes out there or anything like that. I just get kind of the big macro picture, more outlining type of stuff. And then. Uh, like, I never know what's really going to, I don't block out scenes too often. You know what I mean? I don't outline to the sense, like, I know what I want to achieve with every chapter. I know what my intent is, what I need to happen for the, uh, for the narrative. But that doesn't mean I have to have a set piece for it. Like, I don't plan out a scene, like, so-and-so is going to go here. This, I mean, that stuff just kind of happens. Like, I mean, when I'm, when I'm feeling my best, I just, I'm just sort of going along for the ride. But I know that I need to accomplish something in it. And I don't find, I, I mean, sometimes I think I figure out how to accomplish that when I'm doing that stuff in the garage. But then when I get inside, I find don't a way better way to do too. it. Yeah. It always, so, find, you find a more efficient, better way to do it. It's kind of like the end of a book. Sometimes you, uh, when you're kind of outlining the end of the book, you tend to, you know, over explode it or something. Like I just tend to, maybe in my outline, it goes on too long. But then when I'm, when I'm writing it, sometimes like seven or eight pages before I think I'm going to be done, I find that moment, you know, that epiphanic, that epiphanic moment where it's, it's just there. I mean, it's, that's the note I want the novel to end on. That's the note. That's the walk away. That's what, that's what it's, you know, if you don't get that note, right. Have you ever noticed you can, you could be going through a book and 350 pages would be great. Um, and it doesn't that's diminish the ending. book, but if it doesn't have a good ending, if it doesn't have a great memorable ending, you just won't remember it for the rest of your life. I mean, that's the key to really, I mean, I just feel like if you can fucking nail this, you stick the ending, man. It, and so you don't know exactly how to do that. It's not about putting yeah. characters in places necessarily. It's, it's just a note. It's sustaining a note. And that note could be about theme. That note could be about, it could, you don't even know what it's going to be about. It's, yeah. just a, it's just a note. And when you hit it, you know it. And when you don't hit it, you convince yourself you've hit it, and then it starts to bug you after a couple of weeks, and then for a couple of months, and you're like, God damn it, I got to write the end. That I'm still not there. I mean, you can pretend you did it, but when you really hit it, you know. At least I do. I mean, yeah. Well, I would say, you know, as as a reader, one of the, you know, I I love the process of of reading books and going back to revisit that book every night. But what really makes a great book is, is one that leaves you thinking afterwards not just like oh I missed that book or I like it but but gets me you know has me has me thinking on on bigger subjects afterwards and um and that the conclusion ties you know sends you off in a certain direction and I, I think you really accomplish that with this book and it's it's definitely a novel that has um, kept me thinking since finishing it. So, um, Somebody that's... said, did you write any of this book in the North Cascades or have you had a specific location in mind when you wrote this? Um, I've been to the North Cascades since I started writing the book and I'd spent time there in the past uh, shooting a couple of car commercials was the first time I went out there. Tup was there actually. Uh, and I, uh, the town is sort of an amalgam. One of the towns I thought of is Concrete. Uh, there's, there's, it, probably Concrete's the closest so town. Vigil to Vigilante town. Falls, that's the name, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, yeah, it was kind of an amalgamation of places. I didn't choose a specific valley. I wanted to get the, you know, 
I got the geography of the North Cascades down, but like there isn't really a town where I've set, you know, where I've set Vigilante Falls, which we'll is different. We, we, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, didn't no, I don't care. Uh, which is different. I was just going to say than like Port Bonita, which was very clearly Port Angeles. It was west of here, which is this. Yeah, that was very clearly Port Angeles. It was a fictional town, but it was very clearly Port Angeles. This is a little more ambiguous. So we only have a couple of seconds left. Uh, Justin did ask what you need to write about before you croak. Um, and uh, you did write about football, which uh, I know you like football and you got football. I to write about books, football. So. I still want to write about boxing. boxing. I just love, I like. What about, what about insurance? Was it dentist or insurance? Dentist, dentistry. Oh yeah, I forgot about that book. I was writing this other book. Uh, I forgot about that. Grim and, <laughs> Grim and Barra. Grim and Barra. Grim and Barra. Yeah, it was the parallel lives of two dentists <laughs> take very different paths. Uh, you know, this is a slightly different uh, subject matter. I got about uh, 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 that one. Uh, uh, I forgot because uh, I got onto that PTSD reincarnation yeah. one. Yeah. Well, Thomas, thank you for doing this. Yeah. Uh, sorry, anybody, if I wasn't quite on my A game today. I. You know, I celebrated. We drank, last we drank a bunch of IPAs book. yesterday. I celebrated the lunch of my book, and they just kept giving me IPAs all night, and they're just too strong. And I just, yeah, so I'm a little slow. You're, you're always on your A game, yeah. And thanks, thanks Kevin, you. for hosting. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks guys. Um, thanks so much. It was a great talk. I want to show off Johnny's book here. Beautiful, beautiful job by the folks at Algonquin, as always. Hey, look, there's yeah. Thomas's book. Thanks, bro. Thank you. Uh, I put in the chat the uh, YouTube channel, our YouTube channel, and you can watch our events there, uh, past events. And this event will probably be popping up there tomorrow afternoon. Uh, so check that out or tell your friends if you want them to uh, listen in uh, on what they talked about tonight. And I'm going to paste the um, link to Johnny's book here. I can't, you're just muted. Yeah, I, you're muted, bud. We're gonna. There we go. All right, sorry about that. You said you're, you paste, um, paste the link to John's I book. I pasted right it in there. So it's in there. Everyone can click on that to order the book. Um, I think we have a bunch of um, signed book plates uh, that go with these uh, orders too. So if people order the book, they should get a book plate um, that you signed, so. Uh, thanks a lot, you guys. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and uh, have a great evening. Thanks, thanks. everybody. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks, th thanks, hey, thanks Johnny. Thanks, Paul.